Hello and Happy New Year. Thank you for joining me at this slightly unusual version of the EPS London meeting. I'd like to start today by thanking the EPS for awarding me the Frith Prize, which I'm truly thrilled and honoured to receive. I would also like to say a special thank you to the committee for continuing to provide us with opportunities to meet and to share our work even under these unusual circumstances. So, in line with the prize, uh, today's talk is going to be mostly focused on the research conducted during my PhD. So I'm going to be talking about how prior knowledge might influence our ongoing word learning. So we know that vocabulary sets a crucial foundation for children's development in school. And we see that having a poor vocabulary is associated with difficulties across a range of school subjects, but also associated with things like self-esteem and behaviour. And a large word gap already exists by the time that children start school. And this is problematic because it seems that children with poor vocabulary don't start to catch up even when they begin more formal language education. And in fact, the ability gap seems to widen. So this is shown quite nicely in this data from an online project. So the blue line here plots median vocabulary size across different ages. And the grey line marks average vocabulary size at the different percentiles. So if you look on the left hand side of this figure, you can see that the gap between the lowest and the highest performers seems to increase across childhood. So word learning differences are really persistent. And big data like this show us the huge variability that exists both between individuals and across development. But we need experimental studies to help us to understand why. My research has been focused on this later vocabulary development. How and why do word learning differences persist in both children and adults? And we approach this question using models of memory consolidation. So a particularly influential model in the context of word learning has been the complementary learning systems framework. So this provides a really useful way of thinking about how we go from hearing or seeing a word for the first time and initially committing it to memory and how we store that new word in such a way that it becomes part of our long-term vocabulary. How can we uh, both produce it and comprehend it so rapidly? And two, two systems are proposed then to support these different aspects of new word knowledge. So the hippocampal memory system is capable of very rapid learning and encoding information about the new word and creating an initial memory trace. But longer term vocabulary knowledge is proposed to be supported by this neocortical memory system. And this is a much slower learning system because it requires more careful integration of that new word in and amongst all the words that we already know. And because this is a slower learning process, it requires a period of consolidation to allow for those careful integration processes. And much evidence now uh, supports that important changes happen during sleep. So sleep allows for the hippocampal system to replay the new information that it's learned so that the relevant connections can become strengthened within the neocortex. And these processes are also associated with changes that we see in explicit word knowledge. So this is an example from one of our recent studies with children. So we taught children some new words in the morning and tested their memory immediately and again after 12 hours. So you can see that they uh, recall slightly fewer after they've spent the day awake. But when we return again a further 12 hours later, now they've had an opportunity to sleep and we see an improvement in their ability to recall those new words. Importantly then, if we teach new words in the evening, we see that improvement over that first 12 hour period marked in blue there, and that new word knowledge continues to improve and stabilize across the next day. So sleep is providing an important change to that new word knowledge. And we also see this reflected in how quickly we can retrieve the words. So this is data from a speeded picture naming task. And you can see that uh, over half day periods associated with sleep, children become quicker to access those new words, whereas we see no such changes over wake. So after we've uh, come across a new word for the first time, there's still some further memory processing to be done. And this might mean that there could be different sources of variability in those later consolidation processes 
that we don't necessarily capture at initial learning. And one factor that's received a lot of attention recently is the role for prior knowledge. So we propose that prior knowledge might play an important role in word learning uh, in a review paper published in 2017. So I'm going to start today by summarising some of the key areas of research we considered when making that proposal. But since then, my PhD research was aimed at testing some of those questions more directly. And with this new evidence, I'd like to revisit those proposals, think about where they hold up and indeed where they don't. So I'm going to talk about whether there's evidence for rapid consolidation in the context of prior knowledge whether prior knowledge can help us to understand how word learning changes across development, and whether it can help to account for some of this variability that we see in word learning and why those differences persist. So as we go through, I'll pull out some uh, next steps and important issues that I think we have left to address, but I'll try and bring it all together at the end. So first, why might prior knowledge be relevant for word learning? So this idea comes from the uh, discussions about the complementary learning systems model within the broader memory literature. So this slow consolidation process was initially proposed as important for stopping kind of new conflicting information from interfering with the knowledge that we already have. But much of the information we learn isn't conflicting and it can build upon that new knowledge. And so recent discussions have happened over how learning might proceed in those different contexts. So perhaps then making lots of connections to our existing knowledge during word learning leads to more rapid memory consolidation. And we propose that this might also be relevant for language. And if prior knowledge is important for word learning, then this has important implications for how learning changes across development. And it might suggest that we become better at consolidating new words as we get older and as prior knowledge accumulates. But this sits a little bit at odds with what we know about language development. So we see very rapid vocabulary acquisition in childhood, when prior knowledge would be more limited than it would be in adulthood. So one interesting alternative here is that children instead benefit more from sleep. So we know that children have more sleep across adults. So here you can see that uh, the total time spent asleep declines across the lifespan. But what's also interesting is that the quality of that sleep changes. So if you look towards the left-hand side of the figure, you can see that children spend more time in slow wave sleep, so plotted in black here. So slow wave sleep is the deepest sleep stage, and we see uh, these big slow neural oscillations during this stage of sleep. And those slow neural oscillations are associated with memory consolidation. And just to plot it slightly differently here, so you can see it clearly, this is uh, differences between children and adults across a single night within an experiment. And you can see again that children spend over a third of their night in slow wave sleep, so again plotted in black, whereas this is half as much for adults. So perhaps then children's sleep supports their memory consolidation, and that as we get older and our sleep quality declines, we become less reliant on sleep mechanisms and more reliant on our prior knowledge to support that new learning. And this seems quite feasible in a language learning context. We're still very good at learning new words across the lifespan, but we're better at learning new languages, uh, languages that don't relate to our prior knowledge uh, when we're younger. And a final area of research that we drew upon was looking at variability in consolidation in children. So there is a huge variability in the number of words that individuals know, and we can measure differences in vocabulary using standardised assessments of vocabulary knowledge. So assessments that aren't related to our experimental tasks of word learning. And we found that existing vocabulary predicts overnight changes in word learning experiments. So this is an analysis pulled from studies looking at lexical competition. So this is a measure uh, of the extent to which a new word has started to interact and compete with other words um, in vocabulary. So essentially, you can think of it as a measure of integration into that neocortical system. An existing vocabulary predicts the extent to which this occurs overnight. So those with good vocabulary are showing more rapid consolidation. <laughs> 
So this links back to that idea from education research that the rich in vocabulary knowledge are able to get richer and that ability gap widens. So those are some of the key areas of research that we drew upon. And now I'd like to revisit those proposals, starting with whether words that relate to prior knowledge are indeed consolidated more quickly. So if prior knowledge speeds consolidation, we can test this directly uh, by training words that vary in their connections to prior knowledge and look at the time course. So there are a few different ways that this might look, but we initially expected that forming more connections during learning might lead to greater benefits overnight, leading to greater replay. I just wanted to note here that for the remainder of the studies, we weren't contrasting uh, sleep versus wake specifically. So sleep drives the theory, um, but we're looking across multiple days. So I'm going to refer to this as offline consolidation to refer to these processes that are happening in the absence of further input. So we tested this idea by training pseudo words that varied in the number of phonological neighbours, so real English words that can be created by swapping a single sound. So we had one set of words with many neighbours, so an example here would be solly, and you can swap a single sound in solly to create known English words such as silly and jolly and golly. And then we had another set of words uh, without any neighbours, so an example here would be femod, you can't swap a, swap a single sound to create a known English word. So the idea here is that the words at the bottom have more potential connections to words that we already know compared to the words uh, at the top. And previous studies have found that uh, words with more neighbours in the English language are learned more easily. And we wanted to look at this uh, across a course of consolidation and in the context of the learner's prior knowledge. So based on those previous studies, we expected that we might see an initial benefit uh, for words with neighbours, but we wanted to look at how that might change one day and one week later. So in our first study with children, when we tested their ability to recall those new words immediately after learning, we can see that they're better at recalling the words with neighbours in blue compared to the words without neighbours in red. But we didn't find any further benefits with consolidation. And actually, counter to our expectations at the time, the opposite pattern seemed to emerge. So this head start that individuals got from prior knowledge seemed to mean that those words were less reliant on offline mechanisms. And we confirmed this a second time with children. So there were some slight differences here. The second study was looking at spoken word learning only. And we also have a third condition plotted in green. So this was an intermediate level of prior knowledge with just a single neighbour. But you can see that the overall pattern still holds. So children are better at recalling those words uh, with neighbours immediately. Um, but this benefit has disappeared by the weak test point. So when thinking about the role of prior knowledge within this CLS model, in the complementary learning systems model, um, we can see that it does affect the time course, but perhaps not quite as we initially expected. So when connections to prior knowledge were more limited, we saw clear evidence for improvements offline, consistent with this role for sleep. But when there was more prior knowledge available, this facilitation actually seemed to happen really early. And this meant that there was more limited evidence for offline improvements. So this is consistent with the idea that the neocortex might be prior knowledge dependent, and that in the context of prior knowledge, offline processes are less necessary to reach a similar end goal. So, prior knowledge clearly has a place in models of word learning, and prior knowledge seems to actually take the place of offline consolidation mechanisms for some aspects of new knowledge. I think it's important to say that uh, we're only, we've only manipulated one aspect of prior knowledge here. That doesn't mean that other aspects of prior knowledge might share a different time course. It's also uh, fair to say that there might be other uh, changes in those processes happening overnight that we haven't captured by our explicit measures here. But prior knowledge is an important factor. So does this role of prior knowledge then help us to uh, understand how word learning changes across development?
So this idea of having uh, word learning supported either by prior knowledge or offline mechanisms actually fits quite nicely with our ideas about how consolidation might change across development. So our key predictions here would be that children should benefit more with these opportunities for offline consolidation in line with their ongoing brain development and the differences that we see in sleep. But adults should show larger benefits of our prior knowledge manipulations. So they should have more prior knowledge to draw upon and benefit from more of the neighbours. So here we have our child study on the left and we ran a similar experiment in adults. And we largely expected, expected the same pattern of results. So we wanted to be able to draw conceptual comparisons in the first instance. So this was pre-registered and analysed independently. So we see with adults, they also show an initial benefit from prior knowledge. They're better at recalling those words with neighbours than words without neighbours. But we see a slightly different uh, pattern of results over consolidation. So adults also improve in their recall overnight, but they don't seem to improve any further between the day and the week test points. And as you can see by comparing these two figures, there's weaker evidence that the no neighbour words seem to catch up for adults. So we ran an exploratory analysis across these data sets to try and get an idea of where these key differences might lie. So here I'm plotting differences in performance between children and adults. So the zero line at the top, the dashed line, marks no differences in recall between children and adults. And the more negative the bar is, the more that adults are outperforming children in that condition. So when tested immediately after learning, you can see that adults are doing better across all conditions. So there's not a specific benefit for prior knowledge, but they're just better at recalling the words overall. But with a course of consolidation, children seem to narrow the gap across the week. And this is particularly the case for those words that were most reliant on offline consolidation mechanisms, the words without neighbours. So adults are left outperforming children only for those words that can relate to prior knowledge. Now, there were some differences between those experiments that make those comparisons uh, not ideal. But we also had a similar study that was looking at recall of these new words following incidental word learning. So the same pseudo words, but embedded within spoken stories. And in this case, children and adults were tested using identical procedures. And our exploratory analysis here shows a very similar pattern of results. So adults are outperforming children straight away across all conditions, but children narrow the gap across the week. And by the final test point, adults are only outperforming children for those words that uh, relate to their prior knowledge. So adults didn't seem to benefit more from their prior knowledge than children, but the effects did seem to be longer lasting. And on the flip side, children did seem to improve more with offline consolidation. But these differences were most apparent between these later test points. So I wanted to take a step back and look at this uh, across all of our experiments. So these are all of the experiments that um, we've taught children new words and tested their memory immediately the next day and one week later. So this is average performance in four experiments with seven to 10 year old children. And you can see that they tend to improve in recall overnight and they continue to improve in all of those experiments across uh, the later week. So between the day and the week test points. But when we look at this in adults, so these are from the same studies, largely comparable methodology. Adults improve overnight, but they're less likely to continue improving across the course of the week. And we can see that more clearly then averaging across them. The real benefit for children is between these later test points. So children tend to show more prolonged benefits of offline consolidation. But against our original predictions, adults didn't necessarily show a bigger benefit of prior knowledge. It did seem to be longer lasting and they did seem to be less able to compensate uh, for a lack of prior knowledge with offline mechanisms. Um, so this suggests that perhaps the relative contributions of offline mechanisms and prior knowledge do seem to change and shift across development. So this is consistent with our understanding um, of brain development and differences in sleep architecture. 
but we don't yet know whether sleep is the driver here. It could be something else, it could relate to our repeat testing, or perhaps an interaction between the two. And I also think now that we've found this difference, it will be interesting to look um, at how that trajectory plays out. And um, so where, where do the changes lie across development? So final question, can differences in the learner's prior knowledge help to account for variability in vocabulary learning? Does this inform how the rich get richer? So this relationship between existing vocabulary and overnight change in word measures was a key part of our initial proposal. So we'd looked at this in this measure of integration. And a few studies had also shown this relationship with measures of explicit word knowledge as well. So here we can see that vocabulary uh, predicts improvements in word recall overnight. And since then, uh, within the Sleep Language and Memory Lab, there have been six studies that were aimed at testing this relationship between existing vocabulary and word learning more directly. So this actually breaks down into 10 separate experiments and samples. I've done children at the top and adults at the bottom. And some of those also had uh, separate assessments of uh, memory for the new word forms and memory for their meaning. But in each of these, we asked, does existing vocabulary knowledge predict memory for new words? And generally speaking, the answer was yes. So these are model estimates from each analysis, so averaging across all other manipulations in the study. And the 95% confidence intervals then mark a significant relationship where they don't cross that dashed line at zero. So there are one or two that don't, but generally uh, existing vocabulary does predict memory for new words. And that's regardless of the particular paradigm, the aspect of new word knowledge that we tested and the age group. But this doesn't necessarily uh, tell us about a role for prior knowledge. So this might reflect just more general learning ability. And studies one and two were designed to examine this relationship more closely. So in our studies, phonological neighbours that I showed you earlier, we tested the hypothesis that individuals with good vocabulary knowledge would show a larger benefit from these neighbours. So under the assumption that they would know more of them. And this was not the case. So as you can see here, individuals with good vocabulary are uh, recalling more words overall, but this isn't a specific benefit for the many neighbor condition. And this was the case across all of our experiments um, with adults, with children, in uh, explicit vocabulary instruction, incidental word learning. We don't see an interaction between these two conditions. And we think a key reason for this might be that actually knowing one neighbor is enough here. So when we introduced the one neighbor condition, we'd predicted that this might be most sensitive to individual differences in vocabulary knowledge. And this was the case, at least for adults. So you can see here, the line is steepest uh, in green, so for the one neighbor condition. And if we take the individuals with good vocabulary, for example, you can see that they're benefiting from having that neighbor compared to uh, words without neighbors but they don't seem to benefit any further from having many neighbors available. So one neighbor is enough to provide support. So this might also be why we didn't see a difference between children and adults. And we'd also predicted in these studies that existing vocabulary knowledge would predict that overnight consolidation, as I showed you at the start of this section. But this was also not the case. So we didn't find in this experiment that vocabulary predicted overnight change, just um, it predicted overall performance. So to bring that question back to all of our studies, does existing vocabulary predict consolidation of new words? We found that this was rarely the case. So only in four of the studies did we see this, and only for children. So lesson number one here is that vocabulary doesn't predict our overnight consolidation to the extent that we thought it might. And this is arguably consistent with our conclusions earlier in the talk that prior knowledge influences occur early and not during offline consolidation. But thinking about the instances where we have seen this relationship, I do think that these could just be spurious. Um, it's fair to say they didn't necessarily emerge where we expected them to. But it is worth taking a step back and thinking about 
whether there's anything different about these studies that might support this later variability in consolidation. And the one thing I can draw out across them is that each of these studies trained within rich semantic contexts. So studies two, three, and six, uh, the new words were embedded in stories. And although study five used explicit vocabulary instruction, we're learning new words and new items that could directly build upon the child's prior knowledge. So they learned, for example, three new examples of birds, three new examples of dogs. So if we compare that to study one, for example, in study one, we use these novel objects in attempt to control for that semantic variability because we were focusing on these word form relationships. So we could very tentatively suggest that semantic knowledge might be important for these later processes. So manipulating prior knowledge at the word level has led to, uh, we found leads to benefits, but it doesn't seem to account for variability. And there's no variability that there's no evidence, sorry, that this uh, prior knowledge specifically supports um, individuals with good vocabulary. We have a very tentative pattern emerging that prior knowledge might support different aspects of word learning in different ways. So form knowledge seems to almost act like a hook. We don't need very much of it and it can support learning very early on in that process. But opportunities for linking to semantic knowledge might lead to later benefits um, so we've tested this directly once, and it seems now that this might be an important way forward. I should say, though, that we didn't see this in adults, uh, even when we embedded the words in stories. This might be because those particular materials were targeted towards children, um, or perhaps the way that adults will always approach word learning within an experimental context. However, a third possibility is that this could actually be about language comprehension rather than prior knowledge. So for children with poor vocabulary, comprehension might be more difficult and they have fewer cognitive resources available than to support that new learning. Whereas we wouldn't expect comprehension to be a constraint in our adult samples. So there are clearly some really important questions still to ask there. So what does this mean for our initial proposal? Do we need to look at word learning in the context of prior knowledge? Uh, I would say yes. I think it's clear that prior knowledge does have a place in models of word learning. So consolidation processes do seem to differ according to the availability of prior knowledge. And in some cases, the effects of prior knowledge persist. And thinking about prior knowledge is really central to understanding how word learning changes across development. It seems that children and adults are differently equipped with mechanisms that support consolidation and the balance between them seems to change. But however, we have limited evidence so far that these experimental studies help to understand um, individual differences in word learning and the ways in which the rich get richer. And I think key to this is that there are many different ways in which a new word might relate to prior knowledge. And although we previously considered this broad range of contributions, I don't think we were then positioned to make different predictions across them. So where are we now? What do I think we need to be asking? First, is it the case that semantic prior knowledge has this later role in supporting consolidation? We really do need more evidence here, but it seems like it's an uh, interesting and important direction to move in. And I think these questions should try and distinguish between uh, the semantic content of the words themselves and the context in which they're learned. And this will also help us to get at where, whether there's a direct influence or whether comprehension might be mediating this relationship. Another way of getting at that would be to better characterise um, the important sources of variability between individuals. So perhaps unsurprisingly, measures of vocabulary are a really good predictor a really good predictor of word learning. But perhaps then we could try and test more specific hypotheses by trying to capture familiarity with uh, word forms versus in-depth word knowledge, or perhaps broader general knowledge too. And this would help to kind of get us away from the circularity that uh, good word learning predicts vocabulary and vice versa. And I think there are some really interesting questions to explore now across development. So we've seen these differences between children and adults, but this opens up questions about exactly what those trajectories might be 
and whether they have any useful implications for vocabulary teaching uh, across the school years. So coming back to our problem of the word gap and why the rich get richer. I think our experimental studies have highlighted the persistence of these word learning difficulties. So often this uh, broadening ability gap is talked about in the context of literacy and opportunities for children with good language skills to go and learn more words from books. And I think it's clear from these studies that those differences persist beyond uh, literacy context and that children with poor vocabulary still learn fewer words even in these very tightly controlled learning environments. And although we're still unpicking the reasons when and why this relationship emerges, I think examining word learning within these broader semantic contexts will likely better relate to real world word learning and hopefully will move us closer towards understanding some of these different trajectories. So I'd like to end by thanking the EPS once again and thanking these two wonderful people, uh, Lisa Henderson and Gareth Gaskell, uh, who I've been immensely privileged to learn from and work with over the last five years. I'd also like to thank the master's students who helped to collect some of the data and researchers from the Sleep Smart team whose studies of variability in prior knowledge uh, I also included in this talk. Thank you very much for listening and I look forward to your questions. <laughs>